1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, the kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. Here is a trustworthy saving, saying. Good morning, everyone. I hope you've all got one of these um, the sheets this morning with the, with the two readings there. That's exactly the same reading, but from two different versions because that'll be important as we're uh, thinking about this passage. Um, for some of you who may have not been around the last couple of weeks, we've started on 1 Timothy, the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy as he was um, uh, looking after the church in Ephesus. And we said that in the whole, over the whole, um, the whole letter, two things really stand out that, that Paul is trying to get across to Timothy and to the church. Right teaching is important, right teaching of the gospel and right living. Okay, are, the people there are to live out the gospel. And Timothy is, uh, Paul has pointed out to Timothy the dangers of the false teaching and today we want to think about this a bit further. So keep in mind that as we're looking at this letter, the letter has, as you read it in the Bible, it has these sort of um, headings and, and chapter divisions and things. Try and ignore that because when you write a letter, you don't normally say, okay, this is my first chapter, and this is my... We write a letter just, you know, one thought comes after the other, but we're sort of doing it in chunks. There are no chapter divisions in the original text. Each part of the letter just moves on to the next. Now, this passage is really divided into two sections. Um, Des gave a really good, some, some really good thoughts about uh, how we pray for our leaders and... And really verse 1 to 7 sort of picks up that thought there. Uh, Paul is urging people to pray. He says, I urge you to pray, petition, give thanks for. Lots of words which are about praying to God for people. And he says to pray for all people. But then he specifically says to pray for um, those in authority, kings and those in authority. Now that's not something, as Des said, often we do it at... at um, um, at election time, <laughs> but often uh, we, don't, we just ignore the, the, lead, the, the guys who are leading there. So poor old Mr Albanese and Mr Dutton and uh, Chris Minns and all those guys don't get a, much of a look in until there's an election. But Paul is encouraging us to pray for those who are in authority. And I was thinking it's not just political leaders, but it's all people in authority. It could be uh, the local school principals, the chief of police, um, 
those in charge of our hospitals, all those places where people are exercising authority over others. Um, and I don't know if you're like me, but thinking of the political leaders, I'm often pretty critical of leaders. It's very easy to, to bag them out, isn't it? And to sort of put them down and, you know, why don't they do this? The poor, the poor people, they're sort of, their lives are always in the spotlight. Everything they do gets, gets highlighted. And so anything, any mistakes they make or any um, uh, things they do wrong, everyone knows about it. And I guess all the more reason why we should be praying for them and they have a very significant role. So it's interesting that Paul's wanting, um, he, he sort of highlights praying for leaders. Why does he do that? Well, it's interesting because in that society at that time, the emperor was, was the kingpin. You, you, the emperor controlled everything. There were all those under him who, in, in the Roman hierarchy, but the emperor was kind of regarded as, as the Lord and saviour of that society. Um, but for the Romans, they realised that with the Jews, there was a few problems because the Jews believed there was only one God. So they allowed the Jews to pray to their God for the emperor. So as long as you guys are praying and you know, supporting the emperor, that's, that's fine. We'll let you guys keep on worshipping your one God. You don't have to sort of worship the emperor. But make sure you, you, you pray to your God about the emperor okay, and lift him up. And so in a sense, Paul is taking this on. This is a bit like the early Christian attitude, to pray for those in authority. And, uh, but he also adds, Paul's adding here, he doesn't just leave it at that, but he says, um, it's good if, if we do pray for those in authority and, help, and they help to bring about a peaceful place because then that's a place where we can continue to grow and we can live, uh, as it says in verse 2, we can live peaceful and quiet lives in all godly, godliness and holiness. He wants, he wants the, the Christian church, the Christians there, to be growing in godliness. That, that's one of his key things that he talks about in the letter. And then he goes on and says, This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. If there's a peaceful society, the, the word of God can go out, the gospel can go out um, more clearly and it can be spread to a lot of people there and more people can come to a knowledge of the truth and the truth, and he doesn't, he, he loves just coming back to the gospel for the truth, truth is that there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So there's that message again, the message of the gospel that Jesus has died on the cross, he's risen again, and that's at the forefront of our lives and the way that we're, that we're living out our lives. And so I want to just leave it at that, but, there's, but let, us, let us be encouraged to keep praying for our leaders and, um, and to pray that, that they would be wise in their judgments and pray that they would... Uh, have integrity in the, in the way in which they, they uh, lead. Okay, now part two of this, uh, of this um, chapter, verse 8 to 15. Paul now addresses some problems. There are angry men disputing there in verse 8. There are, uh, we're not told what about or with who, but it doesn't fit with people who are followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus are not called to be angry, or to be people who dispute. And so it's interesting, this image. He says, I want you to lift holy hands in prayer. This, is, this was the posture of the, of the Jewish prayer. Open hands before God. I don't want you to have angry fists which are closed against others. So it's a lovely sort of image there that, that Paul has. I want you to have open hands for prayer, not angry fists. And then the women, he goes on to in, in, um, in verse 9, I want women to, to dress appropriately, to dress modestly, with decency. So the women are wearing inappropriate clothing and hairstyles. And then he goes on to say women need to learn, but they also need to be quiet. And these verses are some of the most hotly debated verses by Christians. Um, some of you might be aware of that, some of you may not be. Um, but so we're going to be tackling those now. What exactly is Paul saying? Now I can't 
we, we've only, I don't want to go on, I could go on for a long time, but I don't want to do that. Um, but I do want to try and give us some understanding of what Paul is on about when he, when he says these words. Now have a look at the second passage. I'm not going to read it all, but it's basically verse 1 to, to 10, very, very similar. The wording is much the same as what Deb just read to us. I'm just going to read verse 11 to 15. And you'll notice that there's a slight difference. This is another translation. He says, in that translation, he says, let a, let a woman learn in a quiet and submissive fashion. I do not, however, permit her to teach with the intent to dominate a man. She must be gentle in her demeanour. Adam was created first, you see, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and fell into trespass. She will, however, be kept safe through the process of childbirth if she continues in faith, love and holiness with prudence. So you, you might have noticed there's a slight difference there and we'll come to that as, as we, um, as, as we uh, look at these verses. Okay, the, remember, as we said last week, the constant talk in this letter is about false teaching. Paul is saying to Timothy, I want you to, 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 um, to stop this false teaching. And here are some of the things, uh, and, and, and to keep going back to the gospel and make sure the gospel, the truth about Jesus, uh, Jesus' death and resurrection are at the forefront of what's being taught. Not these other things going back to some of the religious laws or other things, the myths and genealogies. And so um, it's, as, we, as we think about what he's, what he's saying here, it's helpful to go back to Acts chapter 19. This was where Paul visited uh, Ephesus. It was on his third missionary journey and two key things uh, happen in this time. Uh, in, in, I'll just do a very brief summary, but it, I think it's helpful to give us a bit of that background. In the first half of that chapter, what Paul is doing is he, he meets some people at first who have been baptised into John's baptism, and so they haven't received the Holy Spirit. So he prays for them, they receive the Holy Spirit. Then he's, it talks about him uh, going to the synagogue and he's preaching there. He does that for about three months. There's a pretty poor response from the Jews there. And in the end, he says, OK, I'm, I'm going to go and speak to the Gentiles. And so for the next two years, he actually sets himself up in this hall, a hall that belongs to a guy called Tyrannus, and he, just, he preaches there. Lots of things happen in that time. There's, there's many miracles, all kinds of strange things, actually, because, you know, he, um, people will have a, a handkerchief that maybe Paul touched or something, and they, that somehow is used to bring about healing, um, there's uh, Paul drives out evil spirits from people. Then there's also people who try to copy. They think, wow, this guy has a lot of uh, power. They try to copy Paul and they actually find that they get bashed up themselves by the evil spirits because the evil spirits are saying, who are you uh, talking to me? You're not, you know, you're, you're not powerful at all because they're not doing it in the name of Jesus. And so these guys get bashed up. So there's all these sorcerers. And in the end, um, these, there's sorcerers there, sorcerers as well, and they, they actually repent and they destroy their spells. So there's thousands of dollars worth of uh, spells that are burnt by these sorcerers. So there's all kinds of things happening. That's the first half. The second half, we hear about this uh, worship of the goddess Artemis, and there's a big riot in the, in the city. Because the silversmith, you know, Artemis is a, is a pretty, um, it was a very uh, famous god, and this was the centre of the worship. Lots of people would come, pilgrims from all over the world, Mediterranean world would come, and the silversmiths there would you know, make lots of kind of little things to, you know, people could sort of buy there and take home, and so it was a, a roaring trade for them. Paul comes along and people are being converted out of Artemis, and then and Paul is sort of saying that Artemis isn't really a god and so people aren't following up there's not as much their, their sales are going down and they're really upset they're not upset because so much for Artemis but because they're losing money and so there's this big riot and they're, they're threatening Paul and um, um, there's it, it, in the end that the riot is kind of stopped but 
It's important to realize that this Artemis was, was a very important worship in, probably the most important worship in Ephesus. And Paul is there for two years. He'd observed all that was going on in this, in this city. And I think this informs how he's speaking to the people here. Okay, so let's go back a bit then. Paul has just been talking about our prayer concerns to pray especially for leaders so that there might be peace and we can live quiet lives of godliness. He's concerned about that, that there is order. This will enable the gospel message to go out to people. Men are to pray with open hands, not clenched fists. A bit like James's teaching, where he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For man's anger, anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. That's what that's what should come out of our understanding of the gospel, should come a righteous life. And then we come to this, the women's dress, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls or expensive clothes. It's fascinating that he mentions things like gold and pearls. I mean, why are those details? Well, the worship of Artemis, it's interesting. We've come over the last uh, number of years, uh, 30 or 40 years, we've come, there's some documents that have come to light. Uh, particularly there's one by, there's a guy called Xenophon who's writing at the same time, the same sort of period as Paul was there in Ephesus. And um, he, he actually, he wrote like a novel. And in the novel, he describes the characters there are actually involved in this Artemis worship. And so he describes um, what happens in this, in this worship. Now, it was actually mainly women who controlled the, um, the worship there. They were the, the priestesses. They were the ones who were in charge of the worship. And they would parade, in his novel, he talks about the women parading into the temple with all this ornate um, uh, costumes um, and with the same hairstyle that he's talking about here with pearls in the hair. Interesting. So, exact, exactly the same sort of details as Paul is talking about here. And the idea was that they, would imp they, would, they were seeking to impress the goddess and um, by, by doing these, uh, by parading themselves in their finest clothes and by dressing up as, as, as well as they could. And if they didn't worship the goddess with enough piousness or energy, Possibly the, the goddess might wreak her revenge on them. And remembering that this, this goddess, amongst other things, she is the goddess of childbirth. So you want to keep, if you're a woman and you're bearing children, you, you want to keep that goddess on, on, the, on your good side. You don't want to get out of favour with her. Um, now, along with, the, with, that, with that particular um, detail, Artemis was also linked with the Egyptian goddess Isis. The women would actively uh, tell the myth of Isis, in which Isis deceives Ra, the sun god, who's the main god, and usurps his authority, takes his authority to obtain power and greatness for herself. So there's all these different stories, myths that, that are circulating about Artemis, about Isis. And um, the followers of Artemis also believed that, um, that, that women were created first, and then men were created later. So keep that in the back of your minds as, as we're thinking about what Paul is saying. And it's interesting how Paul later um, in verse 13 to 15, he then reminds the people of the creation account. He um, talks about Eve being deceived, about Adam being the first to be created. So coming back to the clothing then, in, uh, in verse 9, why does Paul tell these women, I want you to dress modestly, I don't want you to adorn yourselves, with elaborate hairstyles and that sort of thing. Well, I think Paul is saying to them, look, you don't need to wear those clothing anymore. You're now followers of Jesus. You don't have to act like, uh, you know, wear all that ornate clothing in order to please Artemis. In fact, I don't want you to because when you do, it's, all, it's like you're still showing your faith in Artemis. You are now followers of Jesus. Jesus doesn't need any of that. He is looking at a life. And what does Paul say? Your, your life should be a life of good deeds. That's what our Lord is looking for. That comes out of a right understanding of the gospel. These, um, 
So, so Paul is saying, I don't want you to dress in the old ways. And I, as I was looking further on in, in, the, um, in, in Paul's letter, if you go to chapter 5, there's actually a lot of... This, this letter has the most uh, discussion about women uh, of any um, of, the, of the letters in the, um, in the New Testament. Chapter 5, there's a lot about the widows, and we're going to come to talk about that um, later on. But one of the things he specifically says in verse 11 of chapter 5 is he's, he's addressing younger widows. And he says, younger widows um, whose sensual desire, um, uh, he talks about the younger widows whose sensual desires are overcoming their, or becoming more important than their dedication to Christ. These women are going from house to house and they're, um, they're busy bodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. It's sounding very much like the false teachers who go about spreading myths and genealogies and other wrong teachings, other nonsense. And we've seen how Paul specifically singles out the wrong teaching of myths in chapter 1. Could some of these false teachers actually be these women who had had, you know, probably um, who'd come out of the, the worship of Artemis? They'd been uh, leaders there, they'd been uh, ones who are up the front. They've been the teachers there, but they're still learning about the truths of the gospel and they haven't really learnt the truths of the gospel yet. So the instruction in chapter 2 verse 11 is to learn, to learn in quietness and full submission to God. And I think in, this, in these uh, verses from 11 to 15, learning is the key thing. To learn is the key thing. Learn the correct truths about Jesus his death and resurrection, which is what Paul is saying throughout the whole letter for both men and women. And Paul, so Paul's instruction to these women is, while you are learning, be quiet. We don't want you to spread your wrong teaching or deceiving others. And to drive the point home, Paul says, let me use an illustration from Genesis 1 to 3, the true creation story. This is where, this is the truth. This isn't a myth. This is the truth about about how we were created. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Not like the Artemis myths being spread around. He received the instructions from God about not eating from the one tree in the garden. Then in verse 14, still using this creation story to illustrate, um, Paul goes on and says, okay, well, who was deceived? It wasn't actually um, uh, as the... It was different to what the... Um, the Artemis myth said, which is what that, um, that men were deceived, he's saying actually Eve was deceived. That's, the, that's the, from the true story. So Paul is saying we don't want this wrong understanding and teaching to go on. And then he continues with a third point to make from the illustration from the creation story. In Genesis 3, the consequences of sin, when, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the consequences were spelt out for this for, the, for, for Satan, for, the, for women and for men. And for women, it was that childbearing would be painful. But just before that verse, as, as God is um, speaking out the, the consequences for Satan, he says Satan um, will be crushed by the seed of the woman. The woman's child will crush Satan's head. That is, he will kill Satan. What has Paul been going on about throughout this letter? The gospel is to be at the centre of this teaching. The death and resurrection of Jesus is at the centre. When Jesus died and rose again, he in effect crushed Satan's head. Satan was defeated. Now not all women will bear children. There are some women who won't for various reasons. So I don't see how women will be saved through childbearing in the sense that they've all got to bear a child, well, they won't all bear children, and there's no chance for men to bear children either. So what about the women who can't bear children? Well, the context is important. Here is a city with its main worship of Artemis, the virgin goddess. Um, Paul is aware of the, the Artemis cult's belief that the goddess will keep mothers... Well, that's what they believe, that the goddess will keep mothers safe during childbearing, and that's a huge thing. I read, I read somewhere, I was reading, trying to find out what, um, what it was like to have children back then. And some historians say that possibly up to a third of women 
actually died in childbirth. Now that's a huge, you know, one in three chance of you dying when you have a child. So when you have a child, you're taking a big risk. None of us would do that today. Um, they didn't have things like, you know, caesarean um, uh, operations. Uh, infection was always a high possibility. Paul is saying in this, by, by alluding to this uh, particular thing, uh, point, he's saying, you think Artemis will keep you safe? Well, let me tell you that there is an even more important kind of safety for women by means of a particular event of childbearing, which is the salvation found in following Christ with faith, love, holiness and self-control. So I think in, light of, in, light, in the light of Paul's insistence on the right teaching of the gospel, he focuses on the child who will be born to the woman. Yes, women are going, it's women, a woman who will actually bear the child who will be the one who will be the saviour. And so women will be saved through the childbearing, the bearing of the saviour. In fact, not just women, but all those who put their trust both in, in Jesus, both men and women. Because of Jesus, they will be saved and this should result in lives which continue in faith, love and holiness, he says. And this little section, um, I've, you might have noticed that the, the very uh, half of verse 1 of chapter 3, I got um, Deb to read that. Here is a trustworthy saying. And I think this actually ties with this verse 15. Um, you, might have, um, you might remember that back in chapter 1, in verse 15, Paul says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. That's the trustworthy saying, the, the thing we've got to hang on to. What's the thing we've got to hang on to here? That the child will be born who will be the saviour, who will save the world and this, should, this will result in us being able to live lives of faith, love and holiness with self-control. So I think this, this little phrase, this trustworthy saying, is actually chapter 2, verse 15. If we didn't have the chapter 3 division there, we, we might sort of think about that. Um, anyway, that's something, it's, it's, it's not a, uh, I'm open to being corrected on that, but I just think it's, it's, it's significant that that comes just at this particular point. I think one other thing that was really interesting is, you remember in chapter 1 where Paul gives his personal testimony. He does it on a few occasions in his letters. In, uh, in, in Acts of the Apostles, in Acts chapter 26, he gives his whole story of, of how, it, how he was uh, blinded and then he was saved and how, how God worked in that particular situation as he's um, talking to one of the kings. Then in Philippians chapter 3, he also gives his testimony and he says there, you know, I was the Pharisee, of, I was the best of Jews. I had, you know, I had everything going for me as far as I, I did all the right things as a Jew. But that was worth nothing compared to knowing Jesus and, know, and his death on the cross for me. Here, in this letter, what he does is um, he, talks about, he talks about his wrong actions. He talks about himself being a blasphemer and an opponent of Jesus someone who acted in ignorance and unbelief. And I, I wonder why is he focused on that partic those particular things? And I think it has something to do with the false teaching that's going on. His actions and attitudes mirror those false teachers, many of whom might well be women, and Paul is saying to them, God was gracious, merciful, patient to me, so you women learn in submission to God don't be deceived or lead others in deception and become people of faith, love and holiness. The key word in verse 11 and 12 is learn. Learn. And we are to take that on board as well. We are to learn from God. We need to have a posture of learning, sitting submissively and humbly at the feet of God as he teaches us. And this is what he's saying to these women. You are not ready to teach, so don't teach. And don't try to dominate the men who are teaching. And don't keep teaching those myths about Artemis, but let me tell you the truths from the true creation story. Women were not created first, but Adam, man, was created first. So let's come to verse 12, which seems at face value to say women should not teach 
or to have authority over men? Immediately lots of questions come into our minds and it doesn't seem very, um, doesn't seem to fit in with the way our society goes today. But, um, you know, things, questions come to our minds like, you know, not teach at all? Is it just not teaching men? Who, who is it that they shouldn't teach? Well, let's just take, I just want to take a quick look at 1 Corinthians. I haven't got time to look at everything, but in 1 Corinthians, which is one of the letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, Paul says that when women pray and prophesy, so when they're in a church meeting and they're praying and prophesying, which implies some teaching because prophecy, I think, is linked with teaching, they should cover their heads. Therefore, it's assumed that women will pray and prophesy and they can speak in their gatherings. Go into 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26 to 33. I'm not going to read the whole lot there, but uh, Paul says that, you know, everyone has, he says, what shall we say, brothers and sisters, when we come together, each of you, that's men and women, has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So those things involve teaching. Men and women can do those. Um, and then he goes on a bit later, a bit further down. Um, got the next bit. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. So in these particular actions, people will be instructed or will be taught. So obviously Paul's not saying that women can't teach. So, so what's going on here in, the, in, this, in this particular situation? Because then in verse 34 he said women should remain silent in the churches. Is he just sort of having a bad day and he hasn't quite got it all together? I don't think so. But I think there's a specific reason why in that particular church in Corinth, the women there who may be in a similar way to the women in Ephesus, they still need to learn the truths of the gospel before they start to, to be speaking to others. So just, just be quiet. Go, if you're not quite sure, don't sort of uh, raise your voices and sort of start asking questions. Wait till you get home, talk to your husband who probably has the instruction because women weren't taught in, in a, in a um, generally as much as, as men were. And so, um, he, so, he's, so there's this, this whole thing of should, should uh, women be allowed to teach? Well, I think they can and they're allowed to speak in their gatherings. And um, so I think as we, as we think about our context here in 1 Timothy 2, Paul isn't contradicting himself by saying women cannot speak in their public meetings or indeed on other occasions. We can see in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 and 11 that what women and men can do in church is for instruction and encouragement. So, so women can teach. So what's the context for Paul here? And there must be some reason for him giving these instructions. And as I've already mentioned, the things about Artemis worship, I think they make sense of this command uh, that Paul's giving to Timothy. Okay, what about this, um, just to finish off, about not having authority over men. Because in, in one of our translations, we've got um, they're not to assume authority over a man. In the other one, it says, um, uh, I will not permit her to teach with the intent to dominate a man or to have authority. Let, <clears throat> let's just very quickly look at this. The, the Greek word um, is, is a word that sounds like authority. It's authention. And we need to understand what that means because um, it, it's translated differently in these two passages. Um, one, one says that we mustn't assume authority which gives the impression that women mustn't have authority over men and the other one, um, and the other one suggests that um, they're just not to use it in a, in a, in a um, usurping control, taking control sort of way. And the uh, as I said, the trouble is that this word is translated differently. Um, this word is it's the, it's the only time, this particular Greek word, it's the only time that's actually used in the whole New Testament. So we can't kind of sort of look at another passage and say, oh, how did Paul use it there? So what we've got to do is we've got to look at other uses of this word in other literature. And as we do that, we see that it, it does mean this idea of usurping authority, trying to dominate, trying to take control, using, um, you're, you're trying, trying to, 
to dominate uh, the, um, the other. And so he's saying the women here are trying to, you know, don't, don't uh, teach to try and dominate or to, to exert control over the men. So, so Paul is basically prohibiting teaching that is just seeking to get the upper hand, is just seeking to control, get, get control for myself. Don't, I don't want that sort of, no, don't have that sort of teaching. He's not saying teaching generally that, that women can't be involved with that. So where does that leave us? Well, I think um, if I can just uh, come back to verse 15, with his emphasis on Jesus being our saviour, it makes the most sense that what Paul is saying to women and men is that they will be saved through the childbearing, the child who would be our saviour as prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Paul includes this because he has already used an illustration from Genesis and so he continues on with the application of this. The purpose of all of this is to live a life of faith, love and holiness. When we pray, when we dress, when we learn, when we live life together. So Paul, keep in mind, Paul overall is saying to Timothy and to the Christians there, I want you to hold fast to the gospel. Hang on to the truths of the gospel, Jesus' death and his resurrection. And we want to look for ways to live out the gospel in our lives. I want you to make prayers for all people, including those in authority. I want you to live lives of faith, love and holiness with self-control. Now, you're, I think uh, quite a few of you are aware that there are different interpretations of this, this passage. I've given a particular interpretation and I'm really open to, to having uh, to be um, changed on that if, um, and, and, to, and to talk with others about that. I guess what I'd encourage us is to be gracious as we listen to each other to be um, to to pray uh, carefully about this, to be uh, gentle towards each other. Don't let anger control our the way in which we respond to each other. But this isn't. I, I believe this isn't an issue to die over. The issue to die over is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection. We may have differing beliefs about how this verse is interpreted. And I've got, you know, I've got friends who, are, who I highly respect who have a different view of this to me. And I've got other friends who do have the same view. We need to, in love, listen to each other, but also in love be encouraging each other to proclaim the gospel and to live out the gospel. That's what I'd encourage, is, I encourage us. Thanks for bearing with me. It's a bit of a longer talk today. Thanks for listening in. Father, we want to just uh, bring this, um, these thoughts to you. We, we want to be people who have the gospel, the truths about yourself, about your death and resurrection at the forefront of our lives, guiding our lives. Help us to be aware of those teachings which are not true, of those myths or those things which are going to take us away from the gospel. Father, we pray that you would help us to live out the gospel in the way that we act towards each other, the way in which we, we live lives of holiness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.